welcome to Local Heroes from Tower Bridge. This week, all my heroes come from London. In Victorian households, spring cleaning was a messy business. All the rugs and carpets were taken outside and the maids used to beat them furiously, raising great clouds of dust, which then just settled back on the rugs and carpets. Until, that is, my next hero came along. His story really begins at the Empire Music Hall and his name was Hubert Cecil Booth. Cecil Booth was originally from Gloucester, but at the age of 18 he moved to London to study engineering. He got a job designing big wheels for fairgrounds. He would have remained an obscure engineer, but for a demonstration in 1901 by an arrogant American at the Empire Music Hall. Now, in fact, there were a couple of Empire Music Halls, and we're not absolutely sure which one it was, but I think it was here, known now as the Hackney Empire. The American had come to the Empire to demonstrate his newfangled cleaning machine, which worked with a great jet of air. Now, my jet of air is coming out of here. You can hear it, and the idea is it's going to blow all the dust and dirt into this collecting box, which is a bit like the one on a mowing machine. Now, here's some dust and dirt, and if I put it down here, and then I bring it back this way, you'll see it'll all go straight off. Well, actually, it's not terribly good because it blows it sort of everywhere. And after this sort of disaster, Somebody in the audience, Mr. Booth, stood up and said, um, excuse me, why don't you try sucking instead of blowing? And the American said, oh, that's completely ridiculous. It's been tried before and it's quite impossible. And then he took his stuff and he stomped off. Booth wasn't convinced it was impossible and he went away pondering the problem. A few days later, he was having dinner with some friends in a restaurant in Victoria Street and he suddenly sprang to his feet, whipped out his handkerchief and laid it on the seat he'd just been sitting on, and then he sucked. Ugh. Booth almost choked, but he proved that cleaning by suction is possible, and he coined the term a vacuum cleaner. In his patent, Booth has three main bits to his cleaner, a hollow implement connected by a flexible pipe to an impurity collector, a filter, connected to the suction pump. This was so big it had to be wheeled about the streets on a horse-drawn cart and the pipes taken in through a window. So, with a suction pump in the wings, here's my version of the Booth vacuum cleaner. Now here is my vacuum cleaner. Terrific. I'm going to suck up all that dust and dirt through this orange nozzle here. And it's going to go zooming up this wonderful clear tube and it's going to come up here and hit this green mushroom and the heavy bits will bounce down into the blue bowl there and the light bits I'm going to catch in this filter bag, OK? And I need to put that into this drum, like this, and snap it round the rim with a neat snap of the wrist. And then that goes on top of here, like that. And there we are. And now you can hear the vacuum coming out of the end, or rather you can hear the air rushing in. And just watch what happens when I attack this pile of dust and dirt. Does it blow it all over the room? No, it magically removes it from the floor. The effect of the vacuum cleaner and its white uniformed operators was miraculous. Decades of dust were sucked up. The upper crust Edwardians were so taken they arranged tea parties to watch the vacuuming being done. Booth and his vacuum cleaner became the talk of the town and he was called upon to do some really bizarre jobs, like cleaning all the girders in the Crystal Palace. He sent 15 machines and over four weeks vacuumed up over 26 tonnes of dust. One curious thing is that when you're vacuuming your floor, you don't talk about boothing it, you talk about hoovering it. And that's strange because W.H. Hoover never invented a vacuum cleaner. In fact, it was an American called James Murray Spangler, a janitor, who invented a little vacuum cleaner with a pillowcase for his collection bag, went to Mr. Hoover, who was just a big boss manufacturer, and together they started making them. 
And ever since then, it's been called hoovering, not spanglering, and certainly not boothing. When they hear the name Brunel, most people think instantly of the flamboyant Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who built the Great Western Railway and the Clifton Suspension Bridge. But I've come here to Rotherhithe in South East London to celebrate an equally ingenious and much more genteel engineer, IK's father, Mark Brunel. Mark Isambard Brunel was born at Acqueville in northern France. He fell in love with a beautiful 17-year-old English girl, Sophia Kingdom. But as a royalist, Mark had to escape the revolution for New York, where he became chief engineer. However, eventually the lure of Sophia was too great, and in 1799 he sailed for London and married her. Mark Brunel's biggest and most spectacular exploit was to dig a tunnel underneath the River Thames from Rotherhithe right across to Wapping over there. It's about 300 yards, and nobody had ever managed to do that before. The problem is that the ground's very, very soft. It's sand and gravel. And Brunel's triumph came from the fact that he'd worked out a way to tunnel in this soft ground without having the whole lot collapse around his ears. To try and give you an idea of what Brunel did, I'm going to try and dig my own tunnel through this gigantic pile of sand from Rotherhithe here to Wapping at the other end. Now, his brilliant invention, which made the whole thing possible, was the tunnelling shield. And here is my tunnelling shield. And you'll see that it's a box, basically, set at the moment into the pile. And inside it, there are individual boxes here with doors at the back. Now, what I need to do is to open up that door and then start shoveling out the sand from there. Like that. And I want to shovel out just a couple of inches, really. They had a bigger tunnelling shield than that. This theirs was six foot high, so that a chap could stand in it, and it was three foot wide. And at the back of it, they had like railway sleepers across, holding the earth back. And uh, there were three of these piled on top of one another, so that three chaps stood one above the other. And there were 12 shields side by side, so that altogether there were 36 people working away at the face. Right, now I've tunnelled away at least two inches. I'm going to shut the door, and I'm going to try and push back the whole of this box a couple of inches into the hill. There we are. You see, I've got a couple of inches in, and the door is just about shut still. So I've moved forward that box two inches. Now I need to go to work on this one. The work was dangerous, the men digging by candlelight. There'd been a scam involving the surveyors, and the roof between the men and the river was much thinner than expected and often leaked. Worse, it leaked raw sewage, as the Thames was virtually an open sewer at the time. The sewage and poisonous gas made the men ill, including Mark, and his 21-year-old son Isambard had to take over as chief engineer. Ah, oh. there we are. Now, I've moved all four of my boxes two inches into the hill. Now what I need to do is to move the entire outer shield two inches in to accommodate them, and then I can start again. Now, the way to do that is to come back here and just adjust it. Ugh. Brunel's shield was moved forward by huge screw jacks. It moved four and a half inches at a time because that was the width of a standard brick. So a row of bricks was added behind the shield each time. Daylight. Fantastic. They broke through on the 16th of November, 1841, and passed Isambard's son, young Isambard, through the tiny hole. So a Brunel was the first to cross under the Thames. Not far to go. Great. Ah, oh, this one. You can still see how Brunel did it, because his engine house is still there, and so is the amazing shaft that he literally sunk into the ground. He actually built a brick tower here, 42 feet high and 50 feet across. And then he started digging out the earth 
from inside it and the thing gradually sank under its own weight a few inches a day. It took most of the year 1825 to get it done until in the end the top of the tower was level with the ground. Underground you can still see the shaft and indeed the rest of Brunel's tunnel which to this day carries passengers under the Thames. You can't tell because it's dark down here but it's actually about two o'clock in the morning now and I've had to come down in the middle of the night because this is now a tube line and you can see I've come from Wapping and there's Rotherhithe station just there and if I want to go back to Wapping I've got to go north again up this side. There are two tunnels side by side. The tunnel was completed in 1842 amid much celebration. Mark was knighted by Queen Victoria who paid a surprise visit to inspect the tunnel in the following year. But the construction had been financially punishing. Indeed, in 1828, the tunnel was bricked up for seven years while Brunel raised more funds. At one stage, Mark and Sophia found themselves in a debtor's prison and got out only after the Duke of Wellington bullied Parliament into paying off their debts. Nevertheless, he was a brilliant engineer, a real French gentleman, and the first person successfully to tunnel under the Thames. In 1759, Augusta, Dowager Princess of Wales and mother of George III, laid out the first glasshouse here at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Naturally, before she started, she consulted an expert, her chaplain, who also happened to be one of the most famous botanists and scientists of his age. He worked out the answer to the question that was most puzzling botanists at the time. How is it that the sap gets all the way up to the top of plants, especially tall trees. His name was Stephen Hales. Stephen Hales was at Cambridge while Newton was professor of mathematics, though sadly the great man spent all his time in London. When Hales himself was made a fellow, he discovered that he had no duties and could spend all his time experimenting in hydrostatics. This is St Mary's Church at Teddington, where Stephen Hales became perpetual curate in 1709. Stephen Hales did most of his plant experiments right here in Teddington. And what he found about the sap was that three things actually contribute to getting it up the trees. The first was the roots. I've got here an artificial root. This is a tube made of cellulose, which is what plant cell walls are made of. And it's full of concentrated salty water. It's got loads of salt in the water. And in the jug here is plain ordinary tap water. Now what I'm going to do is lower my root into the tap water and what I want you to do is watch the end of this tube here. There we are, that's right Dan, I've just watched the end of this tube. And what happens is that the cellulose tube has tiny tiny little holes in it. Look you can see the water beginning to come out. The cellulose tube has tiny tiny little holes in it and that allows molecules of water to go through but it doesn't allow the salts to go through. And that means on balance much more goes in from the outside than comes out from the inside. So there's water going in through the root and up through the tube and over the top here. So that is the root pushing the sap up the plant. So, just by keeping their sap saltier than the water outside, plants use this trick to get the water in through the roots. It's called osmosis. So that's the first thing, getting the sap up. The second thing is in the stem. Now I've got here a bit of stem. It's actually a bit of broken thermometer and it's got a very, very narrow tube up the middle of it. And that's just like the stems of plants. They've got very, very narrow tubes. And just watch what happens when I put it into this coloured water. You can see the green liquid zooming up and that is called capillary action. It's a natural function of very narrow tubes that liquid will go up them automatically. And that's what happens in the stems of plants. Then up at the top, we come to the leaves and here I've got two bits of celery, more or less identical, and I'm going to trim off the bottom end here so there's a nice clean cut, and then I'm going to take off the leaves off one of them, I think those, They're all the leaves I'm going to cut off like that, okay? So we've now got two identical sticks, but this one's still got its leaves on, and I'm going to put one stick in each of these glasses, which unfortunately is not red wine, it's just water with some red food colouring in it. 
And then to encourage the one with the leaves, I'm going to warm it up with a hairdryer. So, now that's nice and warm. Oh. I want to make the leaf think that it's a nice, warm, sunny day, which unfortunately it isn't here in Teddington. And now I reckon that's had about enough hair drying. Right, now let's see where we've got to. Here's the one with no leaves, and I'm going to break it off about an inch up from the bottom, and then peel back the inside very carefully. And you can see that there's no red on the inside of that plant at all. Now, let's just try this one, which is the one which I've been hair drying. We break that in about the same place and peel this down carefully. And there you can see the red stripes of the food colouring going up the vessels on the inside. So clearly, blowing with a hair dryer on the leaves has had some effect. It's pulled the sap up and what must be happening is the water is evaporating from the leaves and pulling more sap up to take its place. So there we are. Stephen Hale showed in this very church that there are three processes that help get the sap up to the top of the plants. As curate, Stephen Hales was a bit of a Puritan. If anyone was caught in adultery, he made them stand in penance outside the church wearing only a sheet. And he was very much against drink. He published a booklet, a friendly admonition to the drinkers of brandy. But he was, above all, a scientist, and he had his finger in many pies, literally, because he, in fact, devised a method of preventing pie crusts from collapsing by sticking an upturned teacup right in the middle. This is Soho in central London. It's the haunt of a whole lot of media people and also people of a slightly older profession. But 150 years ago, it was a hive of industry. There was brewing going on here and people made percussion caps for guns. And a huge number of people lived in these crowded streets. This was also the center of a vicious outbreak of the deadly disease cholera that within one week, killed 600 people within quarter of a mile of where I'm standing. But luckily, it was the beginning of the end of cholera, in this country at least, thanks to the efforts of a local doctor, John Snow. Born in York, John Snow was described as very timid, clothed plainly, kept no company, and found every amusement in his science books, his experiments, and simple exercise. He moved to London and became a pioneer anaesthetist. He was summoned to chloroform Queen Victoria during the birth of Prince Leopold. Cholera is a horrible disease. When you get it, you don't feel particularly ill. The first symptom is diarrhoea. This gets worse and worse, and you lose so much fluid that the blood gets all thick. Snow said it looked like tar. Within two or three days, half the patients die, mainly of dehydration. People thought that cholera was spread through the air, but because the first symptoms were always in the gut, Snow controversially suggested it was carried in something you ate. In the summer of 1854, a dramatic outbreak gave him the chance to prove his ideas. During the night of August the 31st, there was what Snow called a violent increase in the malady. In the next three days, over 300 people came down with the disease and 273 died. As soon as he heard how violent the outbreak was, Snow determined to investigate it. And because it was so quick, he decided it must be the water that was causing it. So his suspicion fell on the very popular pump that stood in Broad Street on the intersection with Cambridge Street. Now this is now called Broadwick Street, but it's the same street. And this stone marks the very spot where the pump stood. Snow came here on the 3rd of September and examined the water, but there was only minimal visible contamination, and that wasn't enough evidence. He went to the Registrar of Deaths and got details of all the cholera cases in Soho for that week and drew a black line next to the location of each fatality on a map of the area. The most obvious thing was that all the deaths happened very close to the pump. 
In fact, of the first 90 people who died, only 10 were closer to any other pump. Snow came to the brewery here in Broad Street, but Mr Huggins told him that they had their own well, and in any case, the workers never touched water, they only drank beer. None of them died. But at the percussion cap factory at number 37, they weren't so lucky. The workers had two tubs of water to drink. 18 of them died, and the water came from the Broad Street pump. The two cases that really clinched it for snow were of women who caught the disease not here in Soho, but up in Hampstead, five miles away. He was really puzzled by this because there was no outbreak there, and he went to visit the house of one of the women. And he discovered that she really liked the taste of this water from the Broad Street pump, and so she had a large bottle delivered by cart. It arrived on Thursday the 31st, and she drank some that day and some the next day, Friday, and by Saturday she was dead. The other woman was her niece who came to visit her and had some of the water and then went home to Islington and she died there. So Snow went along and told the Board of Guardians of St James's Parish what was going on and then they removed the handle from the pump and still on this replica there's no handle. That was it. Within two days there were no more cases. The important thing about John Snow was that he saw the power of epidemiology. He didn't know what actually caused cholera, but the circumstantial evidence he collected spelt the end of the disease in Britain. This is Imperial College, next to the Science Museum in Kensington. The man I'm going to tell you about did his best work here, where he was known by the wonderful title of Professor of Heavy Engineering. He developed a new form of transport. He was one of the very first television scientists, and he was certainly the best-known engineer in Britain in the 1970s. He was Eric Laithwaite. Born in Atherton, Lancashire, Laithwaite went to Kirkham Grammar School and Manchester University, where he worked before moving to Imperial College in 1964. An imposing figure, when asked what a professor of heavy engineering was, he replied, one over 16 stone. Laithwaite became famous for perfecting an entirely new sort of motor, a linear motor. Now, conventional motors tend to give you rotation which is wonderful for an electric drill or if you want a hairdryer or something like that, but there are applications for which you want movement in a straight line. If you want to drive a train, for example, this isn't terribly convenient because you have to use this rotating motion to drive wheels and the wheels to drive the train, and that obviously causes a lot of friction. And Laithwaite thought it would be terrific if you could take all the coils and magnets which are grouped around the shaft and, and unwrap them into a straight line, and then you might get your linear motion. And here is a linear motor in the very lab where he developed his. And basically, each of these is a coil and an electromagnet, and I'm going to pass the current through and make them all magnetic. And I hold this bit of iron over them, you'll see they are indeed magnetic. This is a piece of iron, and I think you believe that it's attracted to those magnets. But of course, he didn't really want it attracted, because if he wanted to drive a train, he didn't want it held down. That would maximize the friction. He wanted to reduce the friction. So he cleverly used aluminium. Now here's a piece of aluminium, and you'll see it's not attracted at all to these magnets because aluminium's not magnetic. But if I hold it above the whole lot, a very curious thing happens. Look. Now, isn't that amazing? It's actually levitating. You can see it's quite loose, quarter of an inch maybe above the magnets. And the reason why that happens is that in here is a magnetic field going up and down, north, south, north, south, 50 times a second. And that changing magnetic field produces a current flowing in the aluminium. And the current in the aluminium generates its own magnetic field. And if this is a north pole, it generates a north pole here, and they repel one another. And therefore, it levitates. Now, this is magic, of course. If you want a train, then in principle, you could have one without any friction. And the only question remains is, how is he going to get it to move? Well, he thought it would be wonderful if he could generate a sort of magnetic wave to carry the train along with it. Let me show you how it was going to work. Here I've got red, blue, and black 
imagine they're like those magnets and that this is a north pole up at the top and south at the bottom, north, south, north, south. And if I turn my handle a bit, you'll see that the blue then becomes the north, south, and then the black. So they move in alternation and they're sweeping north and south poles along there. And if I put my train on here, you'll see that it's swept along on the crest of a wave. Well, actually, along the trough of a wave, but anyway, a magnetic wave. And that's what he was going to do here. And it was very clever because he's using three-phase electricity, which means that this is a North Pole, and there's another North Pole further along, and this is a bit behind it, and this is a bit behind. So each of these is an alternating current, but they're slightly out of step with one another, exactly as those things were over there. Now, I'll switch on my current, and you'll find that if I release the tether here, I have indeed got what he called a magnetic river. One, two, three. Wow, look at that. Tremendous speed. And we'll do it again. I'm not pushing, I'm just letting go. One, two, three. And that is how the magnetic levitating train was born. One, two, three. Lathwaite formed a company, Tracked Hovercraft Limited, to test the linear motor in a train which ran on a track in Cambridgeshire. Until the government withdrew funding. The idea was taken up in Japan, Germany, and the USA. Ironically, one of the few applications in Britain for this new form of transport was the rig used to crash cars at the Motor Industry Research Association. Linear motors got as far as they did only because of the extraordinary enthusiasm and self confidence of Eric Laithwaite. He was brilliant on television and was invited to present the first ever televised series of Christmas lectures for children from the Royal Institution. It literally flies through space. He appeared on everything now, from Noel Edmonds' multicoloured swap shop to Parkinson, and he enjoyed being seen as an unconventional scientist. Here's a genuine Lathwaite experiment that you can try at home, burning the candle at both ends. Here's an ordinary household candle, and you need to expose the wick at the other end, as I have here. And then you need something like a, a skewer or a knitting needle or a nail that you can warm up and then push through the middle so that the whole thing can rock. And then you simply suspend it and you light the candle at both ends and watch. Now, it takes a bit of time to get going, so I started one a few minutes ago, and my candle is now rocking in a rather curious way. The question is, what makes it rock? If you think you know the answer, why don't you write and tell me about it? Details at the end of the programme. I'm sorry, that's all the heroes from this part of the world. See you next time. If you'd like to try the Lathwaite candle experiment or find out more about any of my heroes, details are on the website at www.bbc.co.uk slash education or write to Local Heroes, BBC 201 Wood Lane, London W12 7TS.